The fact that light travels at a finite but very high speed was first discovered in 1676 by the Danish astronomer Ole Christensen Drummer. He observed that the time at which moons of Jupiter appeared to pass behind Jupiter were not evenly spaced, as one would expect if the moons went round Jupiter at a constant rate. As the Earth and Jupiter orbit around the Sun, the distance between them varies. Rumor noticed that eclipses of Jupiter's moons appeared later the farther we were from Jupiter. He argued that this was because the light from the moons took longer to reach us when we were farther away. His measurements of variations in the distance of Earth and Jupiter were, however, not very accurate and so his values for the speed of light was 140,000 miles per second compared to the modern value of 186,000 miles per second. Nevertheless, nevertheless, rumors achievements in not only proving that light travels at a finite speed, but also in measuring that speed was remarkable. Coming as it did 11 years before Newton's prediction of Principia Mathematica. A proper theory of propagation of light didn't come until 1865 when the British physicist James Clerk Maxwell succeeded in unifying the partial theories that up to then had been used to describe the forces of electricity and magnetism. Maxwell's equations predicted that there could be wave-like disturbances in combined electromagnetic field and then these would travel at a fixed speed like ripples on a pond. If the wavelength of these waves is a meter or more, they are what we now call radio waves. Shorter wavelengths are called microwaves or infrared waves. Visible light has a wavelength of between only 40 and 80 millionth of a centimeter. Even shorter wavelengths are known as ultraviolet, X-rays and gamma rays. Maxwell's theory predicted that radio or light waves travel at a certain fixed speed, but Newton's theory had got rid of the idea of absolute rest. So if light was supposed to travel at a fixed speed, one would have to say what that fixed speed was to be measured relative to. It was therefore suggested that there was a substance called ether that was present everywhere even in empty space. Light waves should travel through the ether as sound waves travel through air, and their speed could therefore be relative to the ether. Different observers moving relative to the ether would see light coming towards them at different speeds, but light speeds relative to ether would remain fixed. In particular, the earth was moving through the ether on its orbit around the sun. The speed of light measured in the direction of Earth's motion through the ether should be higher than the speed of light at right angles to that motion. In 1887, Albert Michelson and Edward Morley carried out a very careful experiment at the Case School of Applied Science in Cleveland. They compared the speed of light in directions of Earth's motion with that at right angles to Earth's motion. To their great surprise, they found they were exactly the same. Between 1887 and 1905, there were several attempts, most notably by the Dutch physicist Hendrik Lorentz, to explain the results of Michelson Morley experiment in terms of objects contracting clocks, showing down them when they moved through the ether. However, in famous paper 1905, a hitherto unknown clerk in Swiss patent office, Albert Einstein pointed out that whose idea of an ether was unnecessary, providing one was willing to abandon the idea of absolute time. A similar point was made a few weeks later by a leading French mathematician, Henry Poincaré. Einstein's arguments were closer to physics than those of Poincaré. Who regarded this problem as mathematical, Einstein unusually given the credit for the new theory, but Poincaré is remembered by having the name attached to an important part of it. 
The fundamental postulate of theory of relativity, as it was called, was that the laws of science should be the same for all freely moving observers, no matter what their speeds. This was true for Newtonian's laws of motion, but now the idea was extended to include Maxwell's theory and the speed of light. All observers should measure that the same speed of light no matter how fast they are moving. This simple idea has some remarkable consequences. Perhaps the best known are the equivalence of mass and energy, summed up in Einstein's famous equation E equals mc squared, where E is the energy, m is the mass, and c is the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, and the law that nothing may travel faster than the speed of light. Because of equivalence of energy and mass, the energy which an object has due to its motion will add up to its mass. In other words, it will make it harder to increase its speed. The effect is only really significant for objects moving at speeds close to the speed of light. For example, 10% of the speed of light an object's mass is only 0.5% more than normal, while at 90% of speed of light it would be more than twice its normal mass. As an object approaches the speed of light, its mass rises even more quickly, so it takes more and more energy to speed it up further. It can, in fact, never reach the speed of light because by then its mass would have become infinite and by the equivalence of mass and energy, it would have taken an infinite amount of energy to get it there. For this reason, any normal object in is forever confined by relativity to move at speeds slower than the speed of light. Only light or other waves that have no intrinsic mass can move at the speed of light.